All right, so I don't even know where to start here. My thoughts have been kind of mangled recently and I realized it's because I've been dehydrated. So I'm gonna try and drink like a gallon of water every day. So like 16 cups of water. Just drinking water has made me feel a lot better. I mean, I'm still hearing voices, but like, it helped with my lethargy, believe it or not. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading on the internet. And I've been reading all these stories. And I mean, I don't want to say that they're really sad. But, you know, they ma they made me think. They made me realize how lucky I am. I mean, I know that my life could be a lot worse, you know, when people say, you know, there are kids starving in Africa. You know, in Africa, we used to make that joke, hey, we're kids starving in Africa. We didn't have any food. So I know my life could be worse, but still, there were some things that I've just been, I guess, ignorant about. I don't know if that's the word. Yeah, ignorant. Um, when it comes to families, I assume that... What? I assume that most uh, families, like mine or... Okay, I assume that most families are like mine, in the sense that they love you unconditionally. I thought that's how families are supposed to be, you know? And I was reading on my V-Files about multiple people. Yeah, Keith Paris. He was like... Afro-Caribbean, gay, and an amputee. These are my labels. And, you know, that's... Growing up in Brooklyn... He became known as Keith the Couple. Like... Anyway, I... Uh, Sorry, my thoughts are kind of all over the place. I know I say that all the time, but that's because it's always true. Um, but the point is, later in the article, when Keith went to his family, and I, I really need to check this so I don't mess it up and then Keith comes after me. Although I don't think he would do that, he seems nice. Yeah, when he got essentially an eating disorder and he says in Caribbean homes saying there's something wrong with you is like saying you're crazy. I talked to my mom and dad about the bullying, how I felt rejected and how my eating disorder affected me. And the answers I got were be a man or you're not crazy, act right. So. And it goes to the day I chose to come out to my mom. It was one of the hardest days of my life. I was already rejected by those around me for not fitting into the ideal beauty standard. To be rejected by my mother was a blow I thought I'd never be able to recover from. My, mo my mom, whom I loved dearly, became my biggest bully. She denied me as her son, when I told her that I loved men. It's just so foreign, like that kind of attitude, I guess, because growing up, when I was really young, 
I was homeschooled a lot, so maybe there's that. And then also just our family is nothing like that. And to hear stories, like, I hear stories, I'm not stupid, but individual people talking about, you know, they have mental illness and this and that, and because this guy was from the Caribbean, but I guess it's people of color, that they don't really take mental illness very seriously. And that sucks, you know? I feel really bad about... I'm not sure about being gay, though. I, I'm in the black community, I don't know. I don't have any friends. And I didn't really come out. I just sort of popped in one day and like took, made sure that everybody knew. You know I'm gay, right? Yeah. Um, and I like said this to my father too. You know I'm gay, right? Yeah. And then I went to my brothers. You know I'm gay. Yeah. So, you know it. To say that, oh, like, no, I don't accept you or this or that for whatever reason, it's just, just the idea of having a mom who looks at you and doesn't see the most beautiful, like, child in the world, because moms aren't supposed to treat their children like that. I know. And I'm always the one who says, don't judge parents until you become a parent. But there's some things that are just like, come on, really? And I don't know, I, I went through, um, and I just saved a lot of these posts and Yeah, that's the word, stigma, that exists, I guess, in the LGBTQ community about, like, sexual violence, stuff like that. I don't know, I just, I feel like Rodney King sort of like, can't we all just get along? I, I assumed that, you know, families were just, like I knew on some level that there were bad parents, but it was kind of an abstract concept. You know, I really didn't think about it until recently and it's like, you mean your mother didn't love you with like every fiber in her being? Was she broken? Like, your parents don't love you? I can't even imagine what that's like. Like, I'm pretty sure one day I told my dad I hated him. Granted, I was like um, eight, but still. And he was like, oh, I love you. <laughs> but, you know, for to be put down by your family. I feel like, okay, this is all over the place because I said the gay community, then I said um, people of color, and now I'm talking about what families. Oh, I, okay, uh, sorry. It's just, it's just weird. It's like, it's almost as if there's like another standard for people of color with all these issues. I mean, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, families. No, I was talking about families. Um, you know, we fight sometimes. I mean, we never argued with our parents. I would be like talking back and if we talked back would like they would just be like 
they would scold us, but that was it. And it's because they, they loved us. They didn't want us to be, like, spoiled. Ugh. But, you know, just the thought of that. You... You know, if I was to, God forbid, like, go on a killing spree or something, and come home to my dad, he'd, like, be really upset. But he'd still love me. Like, that's, that's unconditional love. And this guy, all he's just gay. I mean, it's not really that big a deal. It's not like he's committed a crime or something. And it's like, you should be supportive of your kids because some people can be really mean and home is supposed to be like the place where you go to get away from all that. So to go to a home where there are also problems really sucks. I mean, my experience was nothing like this. I, I, it was totally apples and oranges, so I'm not going to talk about mine. But just that people have these problems then that people as ignorant as I am these people are like ignorant squared or cubed because they're not accepting of their children and when they talk about mental illness they just think it's just you know part of your character or something or like to get over it Sorry, I keep going back to this, and I'm reading it all out of order because I just took a bunch of articles and smushed them together. Oh. I mean, you can just read it for yourself on V Files because I, I don't want to keep you here forever. Hold on. Yeah, my name is just Imani Imani, so on these files. But um no, it just it really irks me when I hear things like that. Like everything that my dad says, even when it hurts me, I know he's saying it with my best interest. I'm very sensitive. And oh my gosh, there's something that I have to talk about. I almost forgot to mention that I've been I talk so slow but um I've been getting the same type of comment like again and again in regards to like my behavior and um like if I laugh at something that's dark it's it's not because I think what happened to me was funny. It's just a symptom of schizophrenia. Like it's one of the reasons I started isolating myself because people were looking at me like I was talking about really sad stuff and then I would like laugh and they were like, Oh Okay. So I would you know so whenever I see those, it's like, I want to tell them and I don't know what else to do because I, I already made a video about it and I don't want to talk your ear off. I know it's because some of you might understand, but it's not just me. It's, it's, it's a symptom of schizophrenia and in turn schizoaffective disorder. It's just, um, I'm trying to see if I can remember the word, though. J 
just because Yeah, see. Sometimes you laugh at like nothing. And then people are like, oh, well, then she's probably lying because she's laughing. I guess lying and laughing go hand in hand. I don't know what the logic is. But. You know, like I just go go here and it says can't stop laughing or smiling, living with mental illness forum and it's a forum and they're all talking about it because they deal with it on a daily basis, and I deal with it on a daily basis, and that was oh, my legs falling asleep. That was one of the things that I liked about being in the hospital. Uh, they didn't give me much to like, honestly, being in the hospital is not fun. Um, but wow, well, this is all over the place. What was I, I was talking about being in the hospital. about the mental hospital, I don't know, last time I was there, which was all the way in December, so a few weeks ago. Goodbye. Oh yeah, I think I told you guys that I had that epiphany. Um, you know, I was in there, and I, I... After a few days, I realized why I did what I did. It was, you know, because my mother's birthday and then my birthday, those days make me very just sick and depressed. My family knows that and they look out for those days. But on that day, like I wasn't at home on my birthday, I got raped, and it's like, it takes a while for me to, like, process things like that, or, I just, in, term, in terms of, like, coping skills, I sort of internalized my anger. I guess. I don't really remember when I was psychotic what I did. I just know that I wrote on the wall, you know, please save, somebody take care of these or something like that. And then I wrote please or something because they, they, you can see where they tried to get it off. They got off most of it, but you can sort of see. And just That was why I did what I did, and then I told them about this epiphany, and they were like, oh, that's nice, okay, so I was like, so I can go home. They were like, no, and they kept me in there for like ever. It only took a few days, but they were like, no, you had a serious suicide attempt, or like, as opposed to like, a not serious suicide attempt, so. but whatever. <laughs> I mean, another thing, and this is just really random, um, sounds like Eddie, I was reading a book, and I don't know if I said this already, 
maybe I'll say it again, but it made me think a lot about institutionalization. Is that the word? If it's not, whatever. Basically, people become institutionalized, and I think I was, or am sort of that way, because when you're in an institution, be it a school or a prison or a mental hospital, which is almost like a prison, there's a certain structure and there are rules that you have to abide. And if you, do, you don't, there's punishment, you know, and they all kind of have the same food sad but yeah but that's not what it's about it's about people get used to living in the hospital where there are nurses at least with me like there are nurses who are there to take care of you there are doctors that don't really listen but i mean there are doctors there should something happen we're able to have group meetings, even though everybody hates group. I've never met one person who likes a group, but during group, we would like set goals and stuff. And then we had to complete those goals. And all throughout the day, we followed a rigid schedule. And it's like, I assume, because I've never been to prison that it would be like that. I mean, they probably don't have group and stuff, but there's a schedule that they follow and they get used to living a certain way. So when the time comes for you to leave, you're kind of screwed because you're, you're used to living in that institution. So you don't have perhaps any coping mechanisms and what'll happen is something will go wrong because you really don't know how to handle yourself out of the institution and then you end up back in the institution and it's like reinstitutionalization or maybe i just made that word up but like i was thinking about that and it's 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 sad because you know, oftentimes you go to the hospital, it's not their first time, you know, the patients. Um, and I would assume in prison there are quite a few repeat offenders, but I, I don't have the statistics. Um, with school, me, I left school and my whole you know, structure, schedule, sort of fell apart. You know, when I was in school, that school that they tried to put me in, even though I finished school, school in America. You know, I was waking up at like five in the morning and getting ready for the day and I'd go and wait for the bus and this and that. And then at school we did things and you know, it was a day, but once I got out of there, it's like, well, now what? So, I don't know. I don't think you can, it's not like the hospital though, or jail. I'd have to choose to go to school and I am. I been taking forever to just take my GED. I don't. I don't know. I just, I don't have the volition a lot of the time. I'm pretty...
I can't remember what I... Oh, another thing I read um, was this article um, about this woman who was assaulted by this guy at Stanford. And initially, when that actually, the case actually happened, I avoided it because that kind of stuff like really gave me anxiety. But since it's been years, I took the time to read what she wrote. And if you haven't read her, um, I don't know if it's like a plea or her letter to the judge, you should read it. Because it was really, it was really good. And it also made me realize that I've come a long way in the sense that what really catapulted all of this anxiety was reading about that case in Ohio. You know, I read about it and just like other things, I just sort of read it and then just sort of, I, I reblogged the post about it on my old Peaceful Eternity hippie Tumblr. It's probably still, it's still there. But, um, then the next day, you know, or sometime after, I was just in the shower and I like collapsed and I can stop crying. So, and it was like that was when my mom died too. It was like, when she died, it was just sort of like walking around. And then I came home and it was like, she, uh, she's dead. And then I, the same, it was that same feeling. It's like somebody punched you in the gut. I'm not really sure what I'm talking about. Oh yeah, that I've come a long way. Basically, I wouldn't be able to even look at an article like that. It would be too triggering. Just saying that word, and it's still not that easy for me to say, but the fact that I can say it sometimes is good. The fact that I can sometimes hear um, somebody suffering, like a woman suffering on like a TV show and not lose it. That, that's progress, I guess. I mean, it's, it's happening at a snail pace, but yes. What? No. It's my sister's birthday today. Oh boy. Well, I feel like this has just been sort of rambling. Like, I, I had something really profound I wanted to say, but it all came out like word salad. That's why I like to write things, because when I talk, it's like... But, yeah, I, I've... I've made some progress, like, I was always saying, you know, oh, if I'm never gonna get any better, and, you know, just give up, and they would offer me medication, it's like, what's the point, like, this is just my life, and, but, no, I, I see now that, that it does get better, really, really, really slowly, but it does get better, and that, I process things really weird, or maybe it's, I go into shock, you know, because, no, I don't, I don't, I don't know, I don't want to, I don't think I can, but like, 
probably in shock when it happened and that's why I couldn't move. So, you know, sometimes it's like when you're in shock, you're petrified and it's... Anyway, I'm not like completely over it, especially one that happened on my birthday, but at least I realize, oh, that baby, at least I real, at least I realize that I was internalizing my emotions the wrong way, and I'm not even sure how that information will serve me because if I get psychotic, I get psychotic and all the knowledge in the world, it, it just goes out the window. I could go on, but it sounds like they brought the baby downstairs and I don't want to listen to him cry. So I'm going to go drink some more water. And yeah, I had a bunch of stuff to say, but there will be other videos, so whatever.